This is Hometown Hero Outdoors. Our volunteers take our nation's heroes into the outdoors. Excursions that will free the mind. United we give, divided we fall. For those who have served, we serve you. This is Hometown Hero Outdoors. Welcome back to everyone who are our hometown hero outdoor supporters, listeners, followers, members, all of the above. We are back with another week's podcast. Today we have Sean Olsberg here as my right hand seat over here helping me guide tonight's podcast. And then we also have John Lyles, our guest. John is a former military service member, veteran, deployed overseas, former law enforcement officer down in the Texas area, and then also did firefighting for a while too. And now he's also uh, in a private industry where he helps start his own career path and uh, with a, he's a business owner. So welcome to the podcast, John. Appreciate you being here today. I appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. And then, Sean, you just told me that it's super hot out down in Texas right now, but you have a hoodie on. Yeah. Yeah. So I got this new uh, AC in the house and my wife is really putting it to the test. OK, that's <laughs> so all right. It's the first time I've donned a hoodie in about six months. Feels yeah, well, how hot is it outside right now? Oh, I think it's probably still 90, huh, John? It's got to be. Yeah, I mean, actually, Sunday down here in the Houston area was a record breaker for us. Uh, I think they, they had us exceeding 108 degrees. And wow. uh, I actually took a picture. Um, I was driving around with the kids at 11 o'clock in the morning, and it had already gotten up over 104 by 11 a.m. It's disgusting. We got our first rain on Sunday at my house uh, in 60 plus days. Wow. Yeah. Well, at least you got something, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was definitely uh, needed over here. Yeah. So for our listeners, if you don't know who John is, John actually is in one of our videos from this last December. John came over to Sean Olsberg's territory to do a youth hunt for deer. So we got the pleasure of meeting John and getting to follow him and his son Griffin while they were out on this hunt, and it was a pretty awesome experience getting to know these guys and watching the bond between father and son. So one of the big things that Sean's done a good job of down in Texas is hosting these youth hunts occasionally, being able to get our our service members, our veterans, LEOs, first responders out in the outdoors, but also experience that with their kids, have some bonding time in the outdoors. So, Sean, you want to talk about your hunt a little bit, and then we'll dive into John's history? Yeah, absolutely. So we... Uh, I started this um, two years ago, so actually coming up, uh, we're getting ready for our third third annual hunt, and uh, you know it was always important to me. Uh, well, what I missed while I was in the service and was always being away from family, and not not getting that time. Um, when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time hunting with my father uh, all season, every season, and. When I was gone, I, I missed that, and so I know how important it is to our to our youth um, to for us to get get them out in the outdoors, teach them conservation, firearm safety, all that stuff, and just be able to spend some time. So, with our busy lives, um, all of us, we need to make some special time that we can just get. Uh, with our with our children and that is the reason behind this this hunt and he hosts it in the de Leon area de Leon central texas uh, is that what you call it central texas yeah north north central north central hmm. and I've, I've had the pleasure of getting to go down and help out with those hunts the last two years and i've brought one of my own kids too but able to come down and hang out with the members and help sean out with whatever he's got going on for that day last year we got volunteered to use our conversion van for the back roads that was all right though <laughs> it's four-wheel drive it's good yeah well the kids enjoyed <laughs> it it was comfortable so so john got to come out and experience that with griffin 
John, just want to let the listeners know about who you are, your background, uh, talk about your military service, your law enforcement, just all the different things you've done. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I guess I'll start where most folks start is right out of high school. I uh, went military myself. And funny enough, I actually went Navy first, something that very little people know about me. Is, you didn't uh, say anything about that before. I would have treated you well, different. Well, you know, um, just wait until you hear more. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so no, I did. Uh, I did Navy Junior ROTC through high school, and uh, it really enjoyed it. Picked up a hell of a lot of knowledge, and then um, I actually went to a family reunion with uh, my ex, and she and I had been dating for a few years out in Burnett, Texas. We go to this family reunion, and I don't know exactly what lake we were on, but uh, I, I was being a show off, and I went and I swam a little farther and harder than I should have, and uh, found myself out in the middle of a lake with you know, very little to no energy left. And, uh, I ended up drowning and, um, Ooh. I, yeah, yeah. So her father actually ended up helping, helping, uh, helped recover me, um, had to be resuscitated, uh, had a, a seizure. And, uh, I remember kind of waking up, uh, laying on the bank, just letting everything out. You know, you lose everything you had inside of you, water, food, everything. <laughs> And, um, I mean, just buckets of stuff coming out of me. And I remember just kind of shaking uncontrollably, but it scared the hell out of me. So the first thing I did, I was actually on a delayed entry program at that point in time and, uh, supposed to be going in as a, uh, EW, uh, electronic warfare technician. And, uh, first thing I did was went down found my chief over at the, uh, Naval recruiting station. And I said, Nope. <laughs> yeah. I'm scared. I'm terrified of the water. I'm not getting back in. Good not luck. my thing anymore. <laughs> he goes, well, you know, you can. You're looking at a dishonorable or you can go pick another branch. And I said, well, grandpa was army, so I'm going army and I'm never getting in the water again. And uh, that's actually what pushed me towards army. And then uh, I go back down to MEPS, pick everything out for army. And at that point in time, you know, I was a pretty naive kid, just spent most of my time in the sticks out in Conroe area here in Texas. And my biggest ambition was to leave. I didn't care. I needed to leave. I needed to get out and so when I was at MEPS, the way I picked my career path with the military was uh, I, I specifically asked them, I said, what do you believe is the next unit to get deployed to go overseas? And uh, they said, well, these guys right here I said, what do they got available? Well, you can go and work with helicopters. I said, great, sign me up. I didn't care about anything else. I just wanted to leave. So I ended up enlisting as a um, operations, uh, flight operations specialist there and uh, worked in a talk most of the time and then actually ended up getting deployed prior to my one year date in the service. Um, got deployed over to Iraq, got over to Iraq and, um, you know, everybody gets put, picked for uh, BS details. And meanwhile, I was, I was, uh, upset with the decision that I had made as far as sitting on my ass in the talk. And, and I said, well, I want to get out of here and go outside the wire and do something. So I volunteered to go out and do route security. And that's what I spent my entire time over there doing. Um, did route security while I was over there, uh, you know, had a couple of buddies get hurt and, um, overall everybody made it back, you know, uh, in, in fairly good condition and that's good. Uh, had a couple of buddies, uh, you know, uh, lose the, the internal struggle after coming home, my truck commander, um, uh, Sergeant Ford. And then, uh, we had another private with us who, who also, um, unfortunately took his life after coming home. So, you know, dealt with those losses. Uh, it was pretty difficult at that time, being young and having not experienced any of those kind of losses before learning how to cope with the, the mental side of it. But anyways, I, I did that. And then uh, after my military time, I, I ended up working out in the North Houston area, uh, just doing security, trying to figure out where the heck I was going to land on, uh, you know, as far as career path. And I made friends with a couple of uh, Houston police officers who happened to be working in the, the, the property that I was assigned to. And I said, well, hell, why don't you put in for the police academy? So I just kindly, or kind of blindly went and just put in because a couple of guys said, hey, you should try out. And I ended up getting the job and went through the academy. And uh, my, my law enforcement career was, was pretty short. I mean, I only did, I think, maybe just shy of eight years. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I mean, within my, my first two years, my first partner that I had uh, ended up being murdered on duty. And uh, that, that was another 
another tough battle um, to deal with. But uh, ultimately ended up kind of recovering from that mentally and, and, you know, had some other things happen while I was on the department. But I was not uh, particularly happy not finding what I was seeking as far as the, the camaraderie and, and, and things like that. Um, I ended up ultimately, you know, I just I was, I was trying to find something comparable to that brotherhood that I'd experienced within the military side of things. And, and I was considering going back into the military and I found a fire department out here in spring and volunteered and worked for the volunteer fire department while I was also a Houston police officer for a little while. And then while all that was going on, I also uh, completed college and I also started my family. You know, my wife and I, we, we actually met at a pet smart here in the Houston area. And after I got back the, from Iraq, we, we had our was kids. the puppy that you brought the puppy made oh, that no, connection. No. She was the one with the puppy. Ah, <laughs> got it. Yeah. No, she had a golden, I, I didn't have a puppy at all, but, uh, love it. Yeah, no, it was, it, you know, all of these things going on at the same time, definitely very busy and, and just, uh, trying to find my place. That was the thing is, it was definitely, uh, I knew I, I had the ambition, the drive and things like that to, to do something. I just didn't know where the heck I wanted to be. So, uh, firefighting didn't work out as, as much as I would have liked specifically because I actually started my master's um, during my, my tenure with the fire department. At that time, I was like, okay, well, I'm a new dad. I've got uh, my full-time police officer job, my part-time firefighting job. I'm a full-time student, Sam Houston State, full-time husband. Like, I'm sitting here going, okay, I've got to I've got to let something go. And um, I went ahead and let go of the firefighting. And then almost simultaneously, as I was completing my first semester for my, my grad degree is a uh, my mother-in-law was diagnosed with ALS and uh, I was extremely close to my, my mother-in-law. That's my, uh, uh, my, my wife's best friend as well. So um, they were originally from Colorado and, and mom said, you know, Hey, I, I want to move back to Colorado, but I'm not going without you guys. So, you know, if you're, you're unwilling to, to make the transition and leave your job, I completely understand because I really saw myself as a lifer at that time. I was already a quarter of the way to retirement with the police department, but, um, I, I definitely find value in family. And I said, well, hell family first, let's go. So, uh, my wife and I uprooted, kind of quit our careers and went to Colorado. And, um, I think within six months of moving up there, mom had passed. So it, it, that was a struggle. <laughs> and then I, I also left law enforcement at that point in time. And I quit my, my, uh, master's program because my, my priorities changed. And I was like, well, you know, I want those things, but do I need them um, is, is more or less where I was. I, I was like, well, I know what I'm capable of personally. I, I don't need that. I can do something else. And my uh, my brother-in-law helped me get into the oil field at that time. So I ended up going and working the rigs. I started as a, a worm hand of working the floor and uh, doing surface drilling out in Utah. And then ultimately worked my way up to working derricks for H&P on a big flex rig out in the DJ basin there in Colorado. And, uh, lo and behold, you know, I do that for a little bit and the next thing springs up and we end up hitting a big oil bust in late 14. Uh, my father-in-law and my brother-in-law got laid off. And as they got laid off, the writing was on the wall for me. And we had an opportunity to go into business together, doing foundations, um, in the, the industrial side of things, uh, for midstream oil and gas had some colleagues over there that were willing to help us out. And as far as give us contract right out of the gate, if we went and uh, started this business for ourselves. So I said, sure. And, uh, I talked to Kelsey about it, my wife. And at that point in time, she was like, you know, we've only got seven grand in the bank and, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're in this transition where, you know, at that point, damn near didn't have a pot to piss in. We, we, uh, you know, had just uprooted the family within the last year and a half or two all of these things. And, um, I don't know what made me do it, but, uh, it was one of those very rare occasions where one of the spouse spouses will put their foot down and say, well, this is kind of non-negotiable. This is what I want to do and what we're doing. And I need you to support it. And, and I did that. And Kelsey was upset with me for the first little bit, but here we are eight years later, we've been in business and, um, we've been leaps and bounds as far as accomplishments for the business and, and, uh, just, uh, revenue generation sales, team growth. I mean, this year alone, we're up 
63% for our revenue generation for our business. We exceeded $10 million in revenue for our first time halfway into the year. Um, we hadn't even done $10 million in a single year previously. So just things like that where it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. It's a big step, you know, jumping off as an entrepreneur. Uh, I did that after, after I retired and you just, there's a lot of unknowns there, you know, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to make my house payment this month or not, you know? It's, yeah, uh, we had that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I remember the first time we, we weren't six months into the business and I was sitting there at the grocery store with the kids telling them what they couldn't have, you know? And, uh, get a phone call and find out that uh, Exxon had paid one of their bills to us. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I've, I've got some money. You know? yeah, right. Yeah. We're getting name brand it. cereal kids. <laughs> yeah. And we're yeah, getting that, lucky charms. That's pretty much it. I was like, Hey, you want that snack cake? Go get that snack cake. That's that, I think that's exactly how the conversation went. Cause I mean, at that point in time, my brother-in-law and I were the, we were the whole company at that time and uh, wearing every hat and we would pay him one month and then pay me the next month. And the company had to be, the priority you know i was running a newspaper route at night while we were running the company during the day and that way i had the money from the newspaper route to pay the bills and and feed the family so it was a lot uh, it was exciting times man what an interesting life you know so many uh and you've just kind of put your foot in in the water and everything yeah, no, it, it's it's definitely been exciting, you know, and there's been, you know, huge personal achievements there, not just for the business, but like, it, you know, my family, funny enough, you know, it, it, I don't mention them enough. And I, I recognize it as one of my weaknesses, you know, through this whole, whole spiel here, I, I barely said much about them. But, you know, we go back to how I started this story about the Navy and, and my, my fear of water. I mean, I was definitely afraid of water until quite literally about three or four years ago, we took a vacation with a family. My daughter was 11 at the time. And um, we were up in Minnesota near Bemidji at a place called Lake Cass or Cass Lake. Cass Lake, yes, sir. So we were up there, we rented a boat and uh, my daughter jumps off the boat into the water and I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know? Wow. And and my, I'm still scared, you know, third, hell, I must've been 36 at the time. and still scared 20 years later and my daughter's like dad get in you know i was like oh okay and i jumped in and that was the first time in 20 years i'd gotten into damn water wow um, that's awesome yeah. good for you though so you have so you have two children yep yep i've got my son and uh my daughter so aurora, uh, griffin and aurora yeah we had the pleasure of meeting griffin griffin's a pretty good look he's a good boy yeah he's got a huge heart very yeah. So what, uh, what's it like, you know, being a husband and a father in as a, as a business owner? Um, it's got its highs and its lows for sure. Uh, you know, fortunately, Kelsey and the kids, they definitely understand that I wear many hats. Um, you know, within the business, there's, we, we've got the entrepreneurial mindset, you've got the management mindset, and then you've got the technician mindset. And, and I, I try to definitely be in that visionary entrepreneur set up as much as I can be and then managerial and down on the technical level stuff as, as least as I have to be. But it never fails. I, I've got to be there to some capacity on occasion and it pulls me away, um, you know, but I also when we we have fun, we're having fun. So it, it's just it's give and take. And I think the kids have, have definitely been the biggest um as far as the learning curve goes, they, they've, they've learned quite a bit. Uh, I know when they were, they were young or, um, every once in a while I'd be like, dad, you're always working. And now it's just like, okay, well we get to do this awesome like trip yeah. and then, and then dad's going to be working again. Yeah. And, uh, so that, that's really what it is, is, is trying to find that balance, but it's, it's so flipping hard. It's a hell of a lot harder than it is, uh, to, to execute and actually do than it is to say, um, but I, I, I do what I can and, and I, I like to think that, uh, I like to think that, uh, uh, Kelsey and the kids respect that and they understand yeah. that. So 
tell me how you got involved in motorcycles. Oh yeah. No, I uh just had my first motorcycle accident. So And we're glad you guys are still here. Yeah. Uh my, my wife doesn't thank you, by the way, but yeah. my, my my wife's not fond of the uh the way I got into motorcycles is uh she was actually seven months pregnant with our first kid with Aurora. And I was twenty three and um I was really interested in bikes. I wanted to get a bike. I'd been doing a ton of just looking and admiring. So uh, one day I told her, I said, hey, I'm not getting a bike. I'm just going to go walk to the showroom, look at bikes again. I'd done it a hundred times before. <laughs> and then a couple hours later, I come home with this motorcycle. And I had never even ridden one, didn't know a thing about it as far as how to ride one, how to change gears, never never been on one. So uh, I actually had to have a guy load my my uh, Honda VTX into the bed of his pickup and drive it to the house for me while I followed him. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I called my sergeant. And I was like, hey, take him more off. <laughs> Calling in sick. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm not feeling too well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I ended up, I think I put the first nine miles on that bike in my driveway. <laughs> oh, that's I mean, I would sit there and I'd walk it back down the driveway into the street and then I'd drive it up into the garage and then back <laughs> down the drive and then open it. And I just practiced getting in gear. And yeah. then I drove that thing for about six months without a driver's license before I finally went and got the damn driver's license. <laughs> oh, I think that's a lot and very common with the motorcycle world. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so I've then, uh, been riding for 15 years now. Yeah, and it's grown on you enough to be a part of the CVMA. Do you want to tell the listeners about the CVMA a bit? Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so CVMA is the Combat Veterans Motorcycle Association. Uh, we're a international motorcycle association, not a club. Um, we are composed of veterans, veteran support members, uh, uh, such as family members as well. Um, and uh, we've got chapters in every state. But uh, it's essentially a, a group of veterans who are also motorcycle enthusiasts, and it's a 501c3. Our, our goal, or rather mission, is to uh, support other veterans who have uh, sacrificed for us. And uh, we basically uh, hold fundraising events and, and things like that, charitable donations. Um, and we'll go out throughout the year and we'll provide for veterans in our local communities. Um, and one of the things that we do on an annual basis is we have a national meeting. And it's in a different lo uh, location every year. Um, and we'll load up, ride our bikes, uh, you know, whatever you've got, and, and go to this location for this national meeting. And we'll typically have, you know, a couple thousand folks show up for that. And, uh, I mean, I've been all over the United States, been able to do that. And this last year, like I said a moment ago, it was in my, my first accident, had, had my wife with me. Was that during a CVMA deal or was that separate? Yeah, that was during our national meeting, actually. I mean, oh, I've really? laid my bike down a couple of times in the 15 years, but I've never had one where it was a, an accident, you know, like where with injuries. Yeah. I've laid my bike down being stupid or, you know, soft shoulder or slipped, you know, on some oil spot or something like that. Just little stuff. But this this here damn near totaled the bike and sent both of us to the hospital and put Kelsey in physical therapy for six months after four hours surgery. Yeah. What did she break again? Uh, she broke her left femur or sorry, sorry, her, uh, her left oh, humerus, uh, oof. just underneath the ball in the joint. So she's got two metal plates and 13 screws holding that arm together. That's not good. That's yeah. crazy. Well, I'm glad it's not worse once again. Yeah, no, it was, it could have been, I mean, I, it was one of those occasions where we were just tooting around town. We were in Colorado Springs. And uh, typically when we just hanging out close to the house or something, I don't wear a helmet. She had hers on. And uh, when we went down, I ended up cracking my head on the ground. And uh, I got knocked unconscious during the accident. And I woke up under the bike and she woke up in the middle of the street and just writhing in pain. So it, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. You're going to say something, Sean? I can see you winding up. <laughs> nope. My screen just froze. Oh, you're breaking yeah, up. No, it's yeah. all right. No, you're good. So I was going to say, I remember uh, seeing uh, your post about the accident, but right before that, you just made a very long post about having a really long trip that you were on to with some pretty bad weather and making it through it and everything like that. Then oh, I yeah. saw that post pop up and I was like, man, after everything you went through on the previous trip and then that happens. <laughs> 
Yeah. One of the things that I'm known for within the motorcycle community that, that I'm a part of is uh, the, the endurance riding or long distance riding. So we do these iron butt rides um, and they've got different levels uh, of difficulty. So uh, the lowest level being a thousand miles in 24 hours, which is what we did. And I, I took some new riders um, to experience that this year and, and they followed me up and we ended up hitting some I mean, we, we hit every kind of weather. We had sleet, we had rain, we had freezing temperatures, we had um, 100 plus degree temperatures all in the same 24 hours. It was absolutely insane. Um, I've done 1,500 miles in 24 hours before. I've, I mean, all over the United States from Montana to Texas and as far west as Idaho, all the way out to North Carolina. And I've never had a 24 hour period go like that. So it was definitely difficult. Yeah, that's wild. I used to ride quite a bit too. And until about, I don't know, I guess about six years ago, I sold my bike and for a, for a, a ranger. Yeah. I, a, <laughs> but I, I used to love riding the mountains in Colorado. You know, it's just a, just get out there and just be free, you know, I do. Yes. That. It's beautiful, man. And I, Hey, I don't think that's a bad choice, though, switching over to that Ranger. I'm, I'm thinking about getting one myself one day. Everything was pretty sweet. He does a nice ride down there. And he has beer holders, you know. There you go. I've got <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> you know, I've, I've always wanted to get into motorcycle riding anyway, and I just can't get myself to do it, especially being in this job. You know, in law enforcement, I've been to way too many motorcycle wrecks and like every time i go to one i'm just like yeah i think i'm gonna probably put that in the back burner longer and you know then i'm think about it and then i'm just just seeding too much of it it's i've had enough of going to those so maybe I, someday I, I i absolutely get that and i absolutely respect it you know uh, i mean yeah you make the best decision for yourself uh, you know, for some reason, I've got this bug and I just can't get rid of it where nothing wrong with that, though. you know, before Kelsey even went to have her, her surgery, she was just like, all right, I need to get better so I can get back on the bike. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it is that camaraderie, you know, whether you're driving down the interstate all by yourself and you come up on another bike and you group together and, you know, and before you know it, you got a couple of couple of bikes riding together and, you know, it's that brotherhood. <laughs> It is. Them, right yeah and, you know and it's funny because sometimes you might even might not even realize it might not not respect the fact that it's there and then you go through an accident such as what we just did and and it was absolutely insane i went 15 days after the accident was the first time i had to cook a meal because they started a meal train for us for wow. 15 days i cooked nothing um we didn't have to drive ourselves from colorado down to texas then we had friends drive us home all the way from Colorado oh, to Texas. Cool. While we were licking our wounds, and you know, Kelsey's still got broken arm, hadn't had surgery yet. We're trying to get to the ortho orthopedic surgeon in Houston, and uh, all these things. So we're just pretty much bandaged up, laying in the back of a truck while they they drove us home. And and then my motorcycle, you know, I went down in, in Colorado Springs. Uh, the local Indian dealer there is uh, Pikes Peak Indian. And um, they got wind of my accident and they sent two of their guys with a truck and their trailer from their dealership down and they picked up my Harley and they took it back to their yard and offloaded it and staged it there and said, Hey, it's here whenever you need to come pick it up, no cost. And then, That's cool. uh, and then I had some friends who funny enough, two years prior, I on viewed them in an accident in Colorado and helped perform first aid and get them to the hospital. And then here we were two years later and they happened to be up there and they're like, Hey, we're heading home. We've got one spot left on the trailer. We're heading to, to Florida. We can stop in Houston on the way home and drop your bike off. So they loaded my bike up on their trailer. They took a detour down to Houston. I gave them the code to the front door said, Hey, drop the bike off, go inside, go to bed, get some rest. And when you're ready, just let yourself out and, and you know, have a safe trip to Florida. And that's how we did so it was on canny. I, I didn't have to cook anything. I didn't have to take us to hospitals. I didn't have to transport my bike. I didn't have to do anything. My whole community took care of me. That's so great. 
so great. Hey, I also, John, you're also a pretty avid hunter. What do you, uh, what do you got? What do you got planned for what's on the hit list this year? So, uh, you know, a story popped into my head just a little bit ago. I wanted to back up for a second. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, you were talking about how you hunted as a child with your father. You wanted to get back into it. And that was actually something that my grandfather did. And unfortunately he passed when I was young and my, my father, he didn't really have a lot of interest in the hunting. So I never really hunted outside of like squirrels and rabbits with little 22 or 410 in the yard. You know, we lived on some property. And, uh, so I go to Iraq, I come home and the first thing in my mind is like, Hey, I want to start hunting. I've never done big game hunting or anything. And, uh, here, here's, a, I, I'm humble enough to admit this. <laughs> I, uh, I spent my entire deployment as a machine gunner and I had this stargazer scope that you had a, a, a work night shift and it had a dust cover on the rear and you had to take your, uh, you had to take your, your eye and press against this aperture to open it up. Oh yeah. Cover so that you could see through your stargazer scope when you were engaging a target. And so I spent 12 to 17 months doing that. And, uh, then I come home and I get on this 30, 30 lever action rifle. My dad was letting me borrow to go out and hunt deer. And my dumb ass, I got right up on that scope and I'm like, <laughs> and I scoped myself and gashed my eye open. Yeah. And I was, I was laughing, but I was so ashamed of myself at the same time. I was at Carter's country over here in North Houston. And I, uh, I took my rifle, my dad's rifle. I put it in his case. I buttoned it up. And I walked out with blood just trickling down my face. I didn't say a dang thing. I just walked out. I got my truck and I left. <laughs> <laughs> I was so Bye. That's so, hilarious. Yeah, that was uh, that was a good experience. Taught me a lesson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Every- this year, uh, this year actually, I got quite a bit on the on the list. I'm gonna get back on my bow for my first time in five years. My brother-in-law, um, not my business partner, but my my sister's husband, uh, Gabe. But we're gonna go uh, bow hunting on his property which I'm, I'm not sure exactly where it's located it's it is out towards um your place sean um out in that area but he's got some acreage out there we're gonna hunt uh do whitetail i've also got a neil guy hunt um which i've enjoyed doing neil guy in the past but uh this year what we're doing differently is we're gonna take airboats out and then um use thermal optics and do a nighttime neil guy hunt down in south texas and that'll be at the end of october Oh man, that's going to be amazing. Yeah. yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to that. And then I had a, a vendor of mine invite me out to uh, go up to Edmonton and do uh, three days of duck hunting in October up in Edmonton, Alberta. Oh, that's so awesome. I'll be, I'll be doing that in October. And I've actually got a dove hunt slated for this weekend. And then I've also got six uh, pheasant hunts lined up with my dog. Uh, wow. I'll, out here in the college station area as well. I'll take some clients and just get them on some birds. Well, that sounds like a pretty good schedule. Yeah. Yeah. It's a full season, man. It's yeah. It'll be busy. Good for you. That good Neil you. guy is so delicious. It's probably my, one yeah. of my favorite meats. So ever. what say, what is that now for people who don't know? Uh, so it is actually, you know, the story, depending on who you ask, is a little different, but essentially it is a very large breed or species of antelope that comes from India. Um, and, and the story goes, at least the one I've heard, is that there was a carny or somebody of some sort back in like, say, 1800 time frame, come over to Texas, had these nail guy he imported as part of his show or something, and then ended up going belly up, released his animals, and uh, what started out as just a couple dozen head is now turned into like somewhere between I've heard numbers upwards of 20,000 head of Neil guy roaming the wild of uh, South Texas. Interesting. I mean, isn't that pretty much a story for any exotics down in Texas? Stuff? Yeah, that's pretty much it. So that's the story <laughs> I've heard, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but uh, it's still a pretty interesting story. That's pretty cool. So you'll have to uh, make sure that we, uh, are you, I assume you're going through someone, right? Yeah. So for that, we're using an outfitter. I'm actually, uh, my, my other brother-in-law, who's actually my business partner as well. Um, he's never been big game hunting before. I took him on his first bird hunt last year and he was just, I mean, he, he got the bug. I could tell 
it was awesome to see his, his just him light up at the experience. And so uh, I'm exposing him to the uh, the big game hunting this year via his first big game hunt will be a thermal nail guy nighttime hunt. Oh, so, that's so cool. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. Sean, we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to follow up with John to see how it goes. and Maybe we can get that contact. Yeah, I'll be down there with my cooler. Yeah, like right. <laughs> well, actually, the gentleman who I want to say the gentleman who I spoke to about getting this set up, um, he does do some stuff with veterans on occasion. So, yeah, I'll definitely put you guys in touch. I mean, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm. I'm I'm taking my entire executive team down there. We're, we're using the lodge. There'll be five of us and we're going to do um, our leadership meeting sessions during the daylight hours, get some rest and then go out and hunt at night. Oh, it's going to be you. great. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. So let's talk about your little Texas hunt. We haven't really got to touch base too deep besides yeah. the video that we made, you know, with uh, Sean there and Griffin. You know, so I know that was a, a a fun trip for me to be on, you know, and we talked about your experience in the video. Obviously, it was pretty raw since the hunts just ended and everything like that. So haven't really got to have much follow up about after the fact, you know, I mean, you got to help me with looking at the video and obviously we screwed up the spelling in your guys' names and that was too late. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I thought there was a lot of very good messages that you had in there. And then being able to watch you interact with Griffin was phenomenal. Um, the things that you said for advice to him, I think a lot of things that parents could take out of your book to help guide how we, you know, hunt with our kids or teach them to get in the outdoors. So I just kind of want to look at the follow-up, you know, like what was the things that happened after, like the drive home? What are the things that you guys talked about? Did you, does Griffin still talk about these things? Like just the video, seeking to watch the video and see that come out. Like how, how did everything go after that? It went really well. It went really well. Um, I think for the first hour we were on the road on the way back. I mean, it was just, I was just like, Oh my gosh, go to sleep. Perfect. So, <laughs> So he, he fell asleep and actually slept for several hours and then he woke up and all of a sudden it was just like, okay, Hey, you play by play again of what had just happened over the last few days. And it was just, it was phenomenal. It, it was, it was really good. And we got home and of course, then he got to retell it to mom and to sister and, and then friends. So it was really, really cool to see him so excited for so long afterwards. And, and then like you said, the video release you know and, and he was chomping at the bit and so was i like hey when's the video when's the video and then finally that video came out and we sent it to grandma and grandpa we sent it to you know aunts and uncles and and then we uh we watched it like shut everything down at the house put it on the big tv in the living room and we watched that and his face just lit up you know like oh hey i'm on tv so <laughs> that was really cool um he still loves that um more maker knife that he got at the the drawing that you guys uh the little raffle that you did yeah so, sean landed that one that was that was really cool. that's awesome yeah i know that was pretty cool um but the whole the whole video i just i just thought it all was laid out very well rogue did a good job but you know can't make good videos without good stories and um good conversation so i appreciate you guys with that and follow up and follow through on being able to do the video with us and tell your story so do you think that it has brought you guys closer together at all oh i i genuinely believe it um you know just for instance you know he'll it's funny he'll pick up on when i'm in a mood or something like that and i don't get like upset I just, I get in a funk where I'm just like, I'm short with somebody, you know, he'll be like, Hey dad. I'm just like, Hey man, just chill for a minute. I need a minute. And he'll just walk up and give me a hug. And nah. be like, All right, man, you need a hug. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's, that's actually exactly what I need. So again, like I said earlier, huge heart, right? Uh, um, right. just for instance, a little bit of a tangent here, but we've got a dog, Ruby, who's a Doberman and she was actually born one month after him. And she's coming up on 13 years, but unfortunately she is definitely at the end of her life and, and we're going to have to have her euthanized on Thursday because uh, we just set the appointment yesterday because she's just um, gotten to the point where she can't control her bowels, things like that. And, and uh, 
today we decided to tell the kids and he just went and laid with her on the floor and just started sobbing, you know, and it's just things like that where he's just got that huge heart and yeah, yeah that's tough. He, he's not ashamed to hide it. So. I know Sean, you're getting ready to say something. You're just trying to conjure up the first few words. Yeah. Let us so fly. I just, you know, uh, for all of our listeners out there that haven't had a chance to go on, on our YouTube channel and watch this video uh, with John and Griffin, you know, uh, it brings tears to my eyes every time I watch it. I mean, it's such a great story um, in, in such a special time spent in the blind uh, together with father and son. Uh, it just brings back so many memories, and and one one of the one of the times that really sticks in my mind is when um, you had animals in front of you, and and it was Griffin was on the gun, and and he was all lined up, and everything was there, and he just he just didn't feel like it was the right time, and how you handled that situation, John. Um, I mean, you father of the year. I mean, that was. It was right. just amazing how how uh, calmly you you accepted that, and it was good. And where I think I've I've probably witnessed other some others that would have went the other direction and just kind of forced it on them. And uh, yeah, so for that, sir, I applaud you. Kind of a weird position. Oh. Get your ears on. Okay, cameraman, we got a deer to the right of the feeder, left of the big tree. That looks like a legal shooter. Young buck, it's a, it's a young buck. Okay, cock your weapon. Select your switch. Now calm down, take a good breath. I can't. You can't? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So he gets on his scope. He looks right through it, and um, I mean, he he gets a good bead on that deer, and all that's left is moving that selector switch and then squeezing that trigger, and he stopped. And he's just like, I I just can't do it. So I said, okay, that's all right, and uh, I went ahead and took over. He asked me to take over for him, so. I looked through a scope, and I mean, he had that scope already dialed in right on that deer. All I had to do was squeeze the trigger, close the deal for him, and it was done. He's expired. I'm sorry. Hey, Griffin, I don't want to hear you apologize again. Reload that weapon. Look at me, right in my eyes. I'm proud of you. Because you came with me and you gave it a try. Get that out of your head. I'm not upset with you at all, okay? Good job. Absolutely. I appreciate that very much, man. I. I think that's one of those things I definitely, I believe I got actually from my dad, you know, uh, you know, he was definitely one of those guys that led with an iron fist, so to speak, like most, most of our dads from our generation, you know, it was just like, Hey, you speak when spoken to. And, and, uh, one thing that I do that resonated with me though, was if I didn't want to, or I felt intimidated by, or was kind of like just scared of something, he would step back and he'd be like, okay, like, I get it. That's okay. I can do this and you can do that. And, and that's one thing I definitely remember. I mean, just silly things where for some reason, you know, like in home alone, kid was scared of the furnace. Me, I was scared of the attic. I was like, you want me right. to get slice out of the attic? You can kiss my ass. I'm not doing it. Like I'll go and shovel <laughs> dog, dog crap. I'm not doing it. And, <laughs> and he'd get his, you know, six foot one, 220 pound butt up in the attic and, and start handing down by and you know it's not like he he had a little six foot ladder he had to climb and lift himself into the attic and he's like all right but he didn't make me go and do it and he didn't ridicule me or chastise me it was just like okay well then you're going to be down here receiving 
while I hand stuff out to you and we'll, we'll find another way. And that was your, that was your dad. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, obviously an awesome trait to pass along. Now, like Sean said, and I'm probably guilty of it. It's some aspect too, with my kids, you know, with hunting, you know, I just, I try very, very hard to be soft handed when it comes to introducing them to new stuff. And I got to realize that it's brand new and that we have to accept that. And we were brand new at all this at one time too. So self-reflecting on what that looked like when I was doing it. My experience when I started hunting was a lot different. I just got back from overseas, you know, so, you know, getting behind a firearm and using that on an animal was a lot different than my 12 year old who's never really been worried. He's worried about the, the kick and everything. And man, we were shooting some pretty heavy artillery when we were overseas. So I was never worried about the kick, you know, so it's an awesome trait to be passed along. I do have another question though, for you is, um, with the video and sharing it with your family, um, were these some things that you that you shared in the video with your mental health or personal experiences that some of your family had not known? Uh, yeah, definitely, man. Uh, you know, I've been pretty. It took me years to be honest with Kelsey as far as some of the intimate details and, and things like that with my say PTSD and my. You know, I did. There was a time where I was just angry at the world and um, definitely didn't say any of that kind of stuff to my parents, my kids. I mean, hell up until that day, I don't think any, my kids, either one of them had ever seen a tear come out of one of my eyes, you know, like, Oh my gosh, dad cried. Like, Oh, that's a big deal. So they, they had never seen or heard really any of that. I, I try to keep it private and not expose them to it. And I don't know why right, wrong or indifferent. I just choose not to. So, yeah, they learned quite a bit about me. I will say that. Well, I thank you for sharing that for us because one of the big things that we talked about before the video is, you know, these videos are meant to help other people too. So our videos and, and my words exactly are the, these things are the experiences that we have are going to be bigger than us to help other people that may not have the ability to navigate those situations as well. But being if we can hop on a camera and we can talk about these things and be vulnerable it helps other people open up and be vulnerable too, to get to that next step that they might need for help. So certainly appreciate you putting that out there. Um, I had a feeling that was probably the first time Griffin has heard that or saw that. So I, I appreciate you being open and honest with it all because I'm sure it gave another aspect of thinking or viewing his own father, you know, that, you know, we're human, we're human still. And these things happen and, we can be vulnerable too. And um, I, I hope to some extent gave you guys another uh, a different viewpoint on life with each other. It absolutely did. You know, I mean, it, one of the, the focal points for me as a father is I try to incorporate what I learn as a leader, managing people, uh, leading a team. Um, and I, I try to take, as much as I can from those lessons, you know, I've got a professional coach that I've hired fortunately been fortunate enough to be able to afford to do that for myself. Um, and I'm, I've been humble enough to, you know, be vulnerable rather. Uh, I've been vulnerable enough to recognize that I don't know everything and that I need a coach to help me, uh, be the best version of myself. Um, the same way that any say a professional athlete still needs a coach, you know, um, and just things like that. So I, I try to take those lessons learned and incorporate them into other areas of my life. And, you know, I feel like you guys definitely um, were huge contributors to uh, empowering myself, empowering my son to have a voice. And um, I, I genuinely believe I'd be doing a disservice to your team and, and everything that you provided for us over that weekend and, and all of that experience if I didn't at least – you know, kind of shed a few layers and, and just try to be vulnerable for a few minutes. If I, if I could do that to help you guys on your mission, which is extremely admirable here at HHO and, and hopefully another veteran out there can hear that message or another first responder can hear that message and be like, man, I can go do that. You know, like if, if it just affects one person, then I got what I wanted out of it. And I, I know you guys did. That's kind of our everyday walk of life. You know, if we have one person that we can help or change their life or 
find a new path for them. You know, there might be hiccups on the way and that's okay, you know, but if it at least gives some direction and clarity and to show that they have support around them, you know, that's, I think that's exa- exactly what we're looking for, you know, and um, no, I appreciate you guys being vulnerable and sharing those things with everyone. And I know one, one of the two different things that I have is one of the terms that I've been using a lot recently is uh, being self-aware. Self-aware is huge when it comes to who we are and what we do, especially as uh, veterans or first responders. And the other part is having some humility. Humility is the number one word I've been using a lot in the last month. And I know Sean's heard me say it a whole bunch, but you know, humility also comes with self-reflection. You know, when you self-reflect, you're able to find these flaws or these issues that aren't necessarily a bad thing. The things that you have to build upon and be able to grow from. And um, having humility is something that's incredibly important. And, uh, you know, not only is going out in the outdoors and reflecting on everything in your life and being able to decompress, but it helps build that self-awareness and thought and the humility side of things and the things that you may need to work on. But that outdoor conduit is something that helps you unplug and be able to have that reflection. So, sorry, that was very much like philosophical and I'm not that way. Oh, that's great, man. I Funny enough, I... I you know, I could show you texts where uh, a couple times a week I have intentional time that I set aside for myself and I will just sit by myself. No music, no nothing. I'll read a book or I'll just sit and smoke a cigar and just think and try to reflect, genuinely reflect about maybe decisions or actions that I've taken over the previous days and how it may have affected others in a way that, you know, it, I didn't perceive initially during the moment or something. I, I try to be empathetic, I guess, is the the best way to explain that. So, I, and I remember just a week or two ago where I was actually in one of those scenarios and I thought to myself, you know, I kind of got on that guy during this meeting and I'm definitely one of those guys who wants to praise in public and then I will correct somebody in private, you know, and, and, and try to be that kind of leader. And I felt like maybe I didn't, didn't meet that expectation for myself. And I, I may have gotten on that guy a little hard during a meeting. So I actually reached out to one of my employees. I was like, Hey man, I hope that, you know, this didn't come off that way, but I could see how it could be perceived this way. I just want to let you know that, you know, I'm just trying to, to help, um, you know, strengthen you as a leader. And so and he came back, he was like, man, I never even thought about it that way. Like you're overthinking it, but thank you. <laughs> I was like, okay, but That's perfect. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure like, because my big goal is, if, if we can avoid any politicking within the workplace, we can avoid any politicking at all where, where anybody's against one another, then the, the vision, the mission, the goal is going to be successful. It's empowerment. Yes. It's empowerment. You know, people have the ability to have a voice and be heard, you know, and that's huge. You know, we talk about that at HH all the time is transparency. You know, if, if there's something that is bothering you, speak up because I can't fix what I don't know. and if there's something that you if there's something that you see that is not going the way that you feel it should like if you don't say something how do we fix something we don't know so speak up you know and that's exactly you know I, but also being self aware we just talked about being self aware and you had that self awareness and that reflection to have the empathy to reach out so that's that's huge empathy is kind of sits up on that level with those other three things i just or other two things i talked about so John, I know you're you're boiling to say something there. No, I'm just taking it all in. I mean, this it's it's good. These are all good points uh, for everybody to to live by and self reflect for sure. Well, I hope I'm not bouncing around too much either. You know, no. I, I take long winded. That's that's no. why we. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's phenomenal. You know, it's uh, it's been a very good conversation. You know, and I think that. I hope that someone who listens to this can kind of listen to everything that you've been through and what you've done in life, but also shows the perseverance of everything that you've uh, engaged in. You know, it, the road's always going to be bumpy. It's just how you deal with that, those bumps, you know, and navigate those and find your outlets of things that will help you, you know, but also in AJHO, we tell everyone that, you know, your family life is number one, your professional life is number two, 
and if you got time as a volunteer, volunteer some time, you know, but also we have members like yourself who absolutely need us. Um, not saying that you absolutely need us, but members out there who do. And, uh, you know, so just if we're not of good body and mind when it comes to doing what we do in our mission, we're not able to help those that need it when they need it. Well, and, and I genuinely believe that that was something that I needed. Um, you know, it, every interaction I've had with you guys has been positive, has, has you know, helped me think about how I could do better. And, and uh, it's not only impacted me, but it's impacted my entire family. So I, I definitely, definitely appreciate everything that you guys are doing. And, and again, I just try to make sure that I repay, you know, I, I definitely feel like I owe you guys and, and I want to do anything I can to help you guys out to, to continue to be successful on your mission. You don't owe us anything, buddy. You're, you're, <laughs> you're doing it right now, John, you know, uh, yeah, we just got to keep going and uh, get more folks to, to get outside and get on the outdoors and come and enjoy our, our trips. And, uh, it's not at all. It's not about the hunt and it's not about the catching the fish. Uh, Correct. there's so much more to it. Totally. Totally. So yeah, we're coming up an hour here. So I just want to thank you both for your time. I just want to see if you guys have any closing comments, John, if you have a message for our listeners or, uh, anything that you generally just want to speak about, I'll give you the floor. The, you know, one of the other benefits here that I didn't touch on that I'd like to touch on real quick is I had the opportunity to interact with some other really awesome veterans and their families. Amen. And at the end of the weekend, we ended up connecting with one another via like Facebook, social media, and um, we still interact. We still see what each other, like what, what our families are doing. I, you know, we get to see the kids grow up. And, and achieve other things and like, hey, man, awesome. Give each other accolades and attaboys and like congratulations. So that is another exciting component here is is the lifelong friendships that come with it. You know, it, it, I might have been, you know, hell, that was this year. I was 38, I think, when I when I came up there, I just turned 39. And I mean, hell, some of the guys that we, we met on this trip, I'm sure will be friends of mine for, the, you know, the rest of my life. So very cool. That's awesome. You know, and I would say nine out of 10 podcasts that we have where we have members who come back and reflect on the experiences they had. That is a very common response that we have, which is absolutely phenomenal. And that's what we want to hear. Awesome. Yeah. Sean, is there any uh, closing comments or anything that you'd like to talk about regarding Mr. Lyle here or, or the hunt or, yeah, this is just, John, a great example of uh, of what can be accomplished uh, coming on one of our one of our events. And I just encourage anybody that that listens to uh, really dig into our organization and, and check us out. And if you have the opportunity to please come attend one of our one of our adventures, because um, you're going to get a, a lot more out of it than than you than you think. Yes, totally. And uh, I, I'm going to make my closing statement here and we'll wrap up for the uh, the, the podcast here. But um, John, I'm very grateful to have met you. You know, I'll never forget that when I put that message out into our group chat about coming down with Rogue and wanting to do a video on someone about this youth on because it's a unique circumstances when it comes to having a child with you. And I think that is a very strong component, you know, getting a child in the outdoors and sharing that bond and having that healing. So I'm very grateful that you reached out. Um, there's a lot of individuals on that trip that were absolutely phenomenal, but I know being on a camera and being vulnerable and candid about your life and where you've been, and where you've gone is not easy. I've done a lot of interviews on these cameras and grace is not always a thing. So you did very, very well. And um, I appreciate your ability to communicate and be vulnerable and share your experiences. So I know it's been some time since our last, uh, we got to see each other last December. So, but, um, I hope to see you again soon. You know, I'm going to be in Texas coming up soon. Um, so maybe we can get together or at least have a beer. Sean, maybe we can squeeze him into coming to the banquet if he's open that weekend. Yeah. I got a seat for you. Come on. 
Sounds good. Shoot me the details, man. I'd love to see you. All It'd right. be great. But I'm just I'm just incredibly thankful to have uh, you and Griffin be able to share your experience there. And sorry we shoved a camera in your face the whole time, but you guys did awesome and everything about it was great. So memories for a lifetime. Absolutely. So with that, uh, I just want to let everyone know that, you know, we have John here and John has shared a lot of his personal life and his experiences and you know, his mental health struggles. And I encourage you all to go watch the video between John and his son Griffin while he was down in Deleon, Texas on a youth hunt. Um, a lot of great messages and learning experiences for anyone who might be a parent, but also us as uh, military service members, veterans or first responders. I think there's a lot of pages we can take out of John's book and, and uh, be able to move forward with just things to learn from and absorb and hopefully implement in your own life if you're a parent. But uh, I definitely encourage everyone who may be having a mental health uh, struggles to be able to reach out to us as an organization and, and feel free to go on these hunts and these adventures that we do because it definitely opens up the door for mental healing. Absolutely does. But in the event that you're also having a moment where you need to speak to someone immediately. You know, our bonds are on these trips, but we're always here for you no matter what. And uh, if you have some struggles and you want to reach out, please do so through our uh, social media, our website. You know, we have a list of phone numbers on our social media, in our private community, as well as on our website. You can reach out to us. We have the assist training. It's the applied suicide intervention skills training. If you're feeling a time of crisis and we need to, we need to help you, we're here for you. So that or you can call uh, 988 which is the National Suicide Crisis Intervention Line. So please reach out to that. We want you to stay here and we want you to experience the things that we get to do on the outdoors. So reach out when you have a moment. But but that concludes our podcast for today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Sean, thanks for being here. Mr. John Lyle, you're a phenomenal human and I hope everything is on the up and up for you guys. But until then, our listeners, we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Hometown Hero Outdoors podcast. For more information, visit our website at hometownherooutdoors.org.